and showtime. Showtime. What's up, guys? Welcome to the first episode of a subsection of No Money But Dreams called The Crypt, episode one. On this channel, me, Bashir, and sometimes Tarek, who has not been able to be with us today, will be talking about what happened this week on a macroeconomic level, digging down maybe into some stocks, and then, of course, looking at the crypto market. So the first thing is, are we in a bear market? The answer is yes. Yes, yes we sir. are. How are your bags, Bashir? How are you feeling? Oh, my bags are, are heavy. My bags are down bad. You know, it's uh, it's not in a. I'm not in a good spot, like from a portfolio perspective. But mentally sharp, ready, and you know, ready to rock and roll. Do my best to get back to those portfolio all time highs. <laughs> For sure, and a lot of good things do happen in a bear market, and we definitely want our listeners to know that if you do believe in the fundamentals of crypto, and you are looking to invest, that losing. Uh, interest in the space now is probably the biggest mistake you can make because staying alert and staying focused and trying to make the most of it, especially if you have liquidity and you have other income, a lot of good opportunities are going to come come everybody's way, in my opinion. And you, you got to be ready. Absolutely. I agree with you 100%, Alex. And I think that, you know, there are two sides of myself that is really uh, battling one another at the moment. Like, I'm horrendously bearish, uh, you know, at the at the time being, but I have to. So why 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 are you so bearish? Can you break it down for us? Yeah, so th there's the macro conditions first and foremost, and for me, it's just that you know you've got really high inflation, you've got the Federal Reserve in the U.S. and and as well as many other central banks around the world trying to raise rates into what is going to be a potential recession. So you've got the you know cash rates and Fed rates around the world are really really low. Interest rates around the world are really really low, uh, but yet inflation is still really high. So there's you know a couple of years of this battle that's left to un, uh, you know undertake, uh, whilst at the same time these massive central banks are going to be unwinding positions that they've built over a really long period of time. Their balance sheets are going to be decreasing. So not only is their liquidity being pulled, but um, you know, they're, they're selling their heavy bags as well uh, or not rolling treasuries to new maturities, which um, weighs on the bond market and the debt market pretty much sets everything else in motion. Uh, and then you've also got, you know, really low growth prospects, um, you know, the S&P 500's, uh, you know, yield and earnings across the board is really poor, even worse than where it was in the 1970s. So the fact that, okay, you know, you try to find something, you know, uh, we've got really high inflation, we've got rising interest rates, but we've got low growth and, and low yielding equities. And of course, crypto, we know where that is at the moment. Um, but yeah, trying to weigh all that pessimism with at the same time, being really uh, inherently optimistic about the long term future of this industry and this asset class um, is super important because Crypto as a whole and Bitcoin itself is, is like really only like 13 or 14 years old. It's like in its adolescence. Um, but we are going to potentially witness the, the deepest and most savage bear market that crypto has gone through because crypto usually has secular bear markets where it's not really correlated that much with equities. Obviously, we had in the 2020 uh, pandemic flash crash, everything dropped all at once. But previous to that when equities were rallying crypto would have these secular bear markets and then these wonderful uh raging bull markets but this is the first time where you know bitcoin and, and other crypto assets are trading hand in hand with macro and until i guess global macro conditions improve um i think that crypto is going to be quite neglected and unloved but that's where the opportunity comes in so you know, don't, don't need to get too pessimistic because then you'll be missing, you know, the, the forest for the trees. Now, where do you see ETH going and where do you see Bitcoin going? We won't hold you to it, but yeah, yeah, as yeah. you see the it's, market uh, today, where do you feel that the lowest lowest point is going to be for both of those two asset classes? Look, it's a really fair call. Bitcoin right now and Ethereum right now are just sitting above really key support levels. BTC sitting above 20K and ETH sitting above 1K. Uh, if they lose those levels, because they've been doing this over the last eight months now, six, eight months, is that they'll, you know, have a really volatile, sharp move down. 
then it will trade and range sideways for a little bit, you know, tick up one or two, three, five percent even. And then the bulls are like, yeah, the bull market's back, baby. And then, you know, we just take another horrendous leg down. So I'm really cautious uh, at this level because a break below it, we'll probably see a, a sharp move to the downside. Now, looking at volume profiles and looking at, uh, you know, when the next major level of support occurs for both of these assets is actually quite a, far, a fair bit down because the run up from like 10K to 20K and to new all time highs for Bitcoin um, and likewise for Ethereum from when it broke through that four, um, $1,400 all time high back in uh, 2018 that it had set, there, there was just, it just completely blitzed through those levels. And so it was like, just completely jumping and there was just massive green candles. So there wasn't a lot of time for price action to be established at those levels on the way up. Yeah. So what it that means, on, yeah. And what that means on the way down is that there isn't really established support levels, price action levels. There was never any real bearish fight. So, you know, when, when it comes down, the same happens on the downside. There isn't going to be a real bullish fight on the way down. Volume was quite thin, so it'll just kind of drop through there. So the next major level of support for BTC is around 12K, and the next major level of support for ETH would come in at around 700, 650 um, from current levels, which, um, yeah, it's like another 40% drop from here. And I don't want to give out too much of a bearish target just because, um, you know, things can change relatively quickly. But in the near term, I would say that if we watch where the probable bottom will be, I'm not saying that the leg is going to come really quickly. Like I'm not saying the move is going to happen in another couple of weeks, but the move can happen gradually over the next couple of years as interest, you know, wanes. And then eventually, you know, we'll see, we'll see a nice bottom formation and, you know, things tune up and I'm watching for 2024 really, but we'll discuss that later. <laughs> for sure. Definitely. So, at the moment, obviously, before we were talking about NFTs, specifically Yuga Labs, Board API Club, Mutant API mm -hmm. Club, Mutant API Club. If we're going to denominate NFTs in ETH, those two projects have actually held up, to be honest with you, considering how shattered the rest of the crypto market has been. I mean, you have, today, I think Board API Club is sitting at above 80 ETH and the Mutant Ape is above 15 ETH. So do you think that there is more opportunity in nfts than crypto at the moment or would you consider both of them similar asset class as far as the risk is concerned or no so nfts would definitely be a little bit more out the risk curve because they're uh, a lot more illiquid and you know there's no real uh, established way to enter and exit the market um putting aside the price tag you know if you list your asset there's no guarantee that you're going to find a willing buyer or even catch a bid so that's one thing but even at 80 ETH and thinking that, okay, I'm denominating an ETH, so I don't really care about the USD value. But if you think about it, right, when Ethereum was at 4K, it's akin to having Bored Apes at like a 20 uh, ETH floor and mm -hmm. still performing better than where it is now in USD uh, nominal terms, right? So pretty crazy yeah. to think about, right? So it's like, you know, you've got four times less ETH, you know, and we had, uh, let's say, at 4K ETH you got a 20 ETH floor on a project, it's actually performing better than a Yuga Labs NFT at 80 ETH um, at current market prices. So, you know, and that's something that has to be considered as well, because even if you might have gotten a really great entry, let's say you went out and purchased 20 ETH at that, you know, high 4K level, right? That it was your cost basis for acquiring that ETH. And then you've now invested it into a Board Ape NFT. And that in ETH terms has gone up significantly, but your trade is still down because if you were to then sell that NFT and then, you know, sell ETH back into USD, you've actually materialized the loss despite the fact that you've accumulated more ETH, which is crazy yeah. to think about from a volatility perspective. Yeah, it's quite complex. The fact that not only are you dealing with one asset, which is in ETH, but then obviously ETH is denominated into US dollars. So it's kind of difficult to wrap your head around it. And it depends on what your goal is. Like if you're an ETH maxi and you're just trying to stack ETH, you know, then great. It's it's actually not a bad outcome, but you know, it, it depends. And, but if you're a trader and you're actively trying to generate, you know, monthly, quarterly, yearly returns, then, you know, that's, um, that's a really bad outcome. So I guess it comes down to what kind of lens you've got on at that time. For sure. 
so where do you see that there's actually opportunities now or where do you see them coming? You said that you're waiting for 2024. So you're obviously saying that there's going to be about a year and a half, which is going to be painful, is going to be difficult. Uh, what are you doing or what are you preparing for in order to kind of take advantage of the next time that we get a bull run in the crypto market? Just staying informed, you know, and staying liquid, right? Um, stay in, stay in really high quality projects that you really believe in. Um, work on other things outside of crypto that can, you know, bring in uh, dirty, dirty fiat for whatever reason. <laughs> so you can be able to on ramp it into other risk assets. But yeah, the, the, the beauty of a bear market is that you've got time on your hands. You can be really patient and you don't have to, you know, FOMO or ape into projects and just like, whatever it is, jumping on Uniswap at two o'clock in the mornings, you know, <laughs> cruising open sea until five o'clock in the morning, like all that kind of stuff that'll, that'll come back again for sure. I, I know it will, but you know, you've got the advantage of just be patient, right? You know, really learn, understand the space a lot better, spend time on Twitter, spend some time on discord, you know, ask people around, you know, you know try trading on a demo account, you know, uh, try investing a little bit, you know, set up your own, uh, cold storage device, you know, get really into the space and, you know, chuck a couple of dollars here and there, nothing that would, you know, uh, be a significant investment relative for you and, and just get used to being in the asset class because this is the best time when things aren't so frothy and moving so fast you, um, to the upside and you don't get that real FOMO feeling. You can just be able to learn and, and focus on your craft. And uh, I think that's a really fun part of bear markets is that, it gives you the opportunity to uh, capitalize on your learning, capitalize on being a better trader, investor, more learned about the space and not feel like you're, you know, finding out something new every day or there's this new token that you have to get into. You just learn the basics about blockchain and just accept it for what it is. And you, know, you use that newfound knowledge and when the next bull market kicks off. Yeah, that feeling of not having been involved in absolutely every single shitcoin drop or every single <laughs> NFT project actually gives you a bit of time to have some clarity, you know, find people in the space who have a lot of knowledge, who are building interesting things, listen to podcasts, as you said, get on Twitter and really form your thesis around this. And, and if you are an ETH maxi or a Bitcoin maxi or you do believe in the crypto space, then it's a brilliant time to figure out where exactly do you want to, you know, put your money. And obviously having a business which is generating you fiat is, is super important in this point in time. So working hard mm -hmm. and finding other income streams so that you can get involved in the projects when the time is ripe, I think is very important. And again, tells you that you can't only rely on trading or you can't only rely on one asset class. I think a lot of new people into the market put complete risk and put everything they have into crypto and FOMO thinking that it would never stop coming down. I mean, the same thing happened in equities and those people are completely demolished now. So how do you manage your risk or how would you suggest people to look at managing their risk? Yeah, have have an idea of what your take profit is actually looking like when you're entering into a trade or entering into an investment. Because if you're always, you know, to the moon, to the moon, it's never going to come down and you don't actually have a viable target in mind as to where you want to exit, then it's, you're going to struggle because you're going to be perpetually waiting for continuous portfolio all time highs. Um, now, it, but you could do little things like, okay, you don't want to miss out. So you reduce half of your exposure. So you take some risk off the table. You realize some profits along the way. And if it, doubles again you can take half off the table again you know and then as it keeps doubling you just keep drawing until eventually you've got no more of those units of that asset or that token or whatever it is that's left because you've realized all of your gains and look if it continues to pump without you then you've done right by you and your portfolio and uh, you know you can use a portion of those uh you know new equity gains that you've made into uh, into another project you know and so that's always important Having an actual, uh, as you mentioned before, Alex, an actual thesis when you're actually investing in the space, like kind of like a roadmap and a guide, you know, what's the minimum, uh, you know, what's the fully diluted value uh, valuation that you want to have, like you know, that you when you go into a token, um, what does the team have to look like, you know, what uh, what sort of 
uh, at verticals are you wanting to be? Are you wanting to be in DeFi? Are you wanting to be in NFTs? Are you just going to, you know, accumulate sats and, you know, have a Bitcoin DCA approach throughout a bear market and then just continue to do that in a bull and then realize like a 4X, a 5X, a 6X, you know, th there's so many ways to go about it, but just having a core strategy, which you religiously stick to and relentlessly execute will serve you well regardless. And that's going to keep you honest with your risk management as well. For sure. Now, where do you see the equities market going? Do you see it going even further? You were talking earlier before we jumped on this call about the S&P 500. Where do you see yeah. it going? And do you see it? Yeah. 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 Go on. Sorry. I'm just listening to your question. Sorry. I didn't mean to. Yeah. No. And do you off. see it keep going down or you think that it's going to go up or how do you see this playing out over the next, I would say, six to eight months? And you what do you see the Federal Reserve doing? Uh, what do you think are going to happen with interest rates from a macro level? Obviously, now that we know that <coughs> crypto and also macro um, assets are pretty much moving the same way, it's no longer decoupled. What sort of are you looking at on a macro level to give you an indication of what's going to happen there, which will obviously translate into the crypto markets? Absolutely. So I think crypto has actually been leading the move down in a big way. So we've okay. sold off as an asset class first and hardest, you know, and the, the, uh, the markdown in valuations has been crazy. I think it was something like $1 trillion worth of value got wiped in a couple of weeks in the crypto space, right? So massive, massive markdowns. Um, but we have seen obviously big sell-offs in US stocks, particularly tech, but across the board, it hasn't been that bad. It has been bad, like it hasn't been like great, but you haven't been just getting relentlessly sold to the nines. Whereas I find that that's going to be coming for equities as a whole pretty soon because it's actually got the most negative real yield um, in, in since the seventies, really, you know, so for the last 50 years, it's actually been a positively yielding trade, but now with inflation and the way earnings is, it's the most negatively real yielding it's been in over 50 years, nearly 40 years. So, not a good time to be an equity investor, not a good time to be a risk investor, I should say. You know, putting your capital at work is, is pretty risky, but um, there are bargains with that being said. But in terms of what I'm expecting, I would say that the next couple of years is going to be rough because the, the Federal Reserve and other central banks is pretty intent on getting inflation under control, which means they're going to have to lift interest rates possibly above the rate of inflation or maybe inflation can come down as they're increasing rates. So it gets like four, five, six percent um, would be the Fed's funds rate by the time they cool off and maybe normalize rates for a bit, which would be fine. And even still, four, five, six percent is still historically quite low. If we look at it in the context of, you know, um, U.S. interest rate history, it's still quite low. So it's not like it's all meant to be doom and gloom. Um, in terms of why I'm saying 2024, there's actually a, a, like a culmination of like the perfect storm, right? Because right now we're seeing the perfect storm for a bear market, but the perfect storm for a bull market in 2024, there's a presidential election cycle. So there's change there. You've got the Bitcoin halvening cycle. You've got Bitcoin halvening maybe in May, June of, of 2024. You're going to have interest rates normalized by that time. You're going to have well and truly inflation under control. Um, because it's not something that's that hard. If you're doing this real demand side destruction for two years, you, you're going to get inflation under control, especially once you start seeing an uptick in, um, in, unemploy in unemployment and real wages start to lift as well um, as the labor market, you know, uh, is hope hopefully, you know, stay strong despite all those kind of conditions. Uh, you, you might actually end up with this perfect storm for, you know, a movement to the upside. Um, and that's what you'd be hoping for as a trader or investor over the next couple of years. And will you be investing in any equities or you're going to stay specifically only in crypto? No, I'm, I'm quite bullish on mining companies over and, and primary producers over the next couple of years, whilst this uh, inflation fight is underway, because in, in times of high inflation, commodity products, and we've already seen that now, tend to do quite well, not just energy like oil and gas, of course, but, you know, uh, whether it be precious metals, base metals, primary product uh, produce, you know, uh, chicken farmers, beef, cattle, 
anything that's a primary product tends to, uh, and primary producers tend to do quite well in these periods of time. So, um, and they, they've actually got the added benefit of actually having quite attractive dividend yields. So that's one thing I'll be looking at from like, I guess, a macro perspective to try to capture some upside whilst um, crypto and equities look less than ideal. Um, but at the same time, like I'm going to be uh, religiously dollar cost averaging into Bitcoin every 10, 15% move down that it has. I'll be buying a little bit more, buying a little bit more um, and you know, just trying to get like a really nice sweet entry. And then once I feel that, you know, the prices have gone so cheap, then I'll start probably allocating, you know, that weekly or monthly capital allocation rather than being more equity focused, um, just be more crypto allocated because the upside in crypto is always going to be a lot higher just because innovation and, and also what, what, the, what the Bitcoin blockchain really stands for ultimately, even despite all the crazy volatility that has been going on, it's been producing a block every 10 minutes. So what it's doing from a technology standpoint, it's working perfectly. You know, there's been no need for government bailouts. There's been no need for limit breakers or circuit breakers or anything like that. You know, the system has continued to work as it is. And for a neutral yeah. monetary system that's only 12 or 13 or 14 years old, that's pretty cool to see. So, yeah, I, I think that is definitely going to stand the test of time. Um, there is going to be some things that are going to occur around how the security of the Bitcoin network is going to work once Bitcoin mining is no longer uh, a thing because, you know, block rewards are reducing every four years. But there's really smart people working on that network that I think will come up with a viable solution for network security when the time comes to make a transition. For sure. Now, where do you buy your Bitcoin or where would you suggest anyone who's listening to buy Bitcoin? And is it safe? Um, a lot of people are a bit scared, obviously, what what happened to Celsius and then things you hear stories like Terra and Luna. We're coming back to the old the old times with crypto where everything is a Ponzi scheme and people lose <laughs> trust in, yeah. in platforms. So what would be your suggestion for people who wanted to dollar cost average into Bitcoin and ETH? Yeah, so for for like your everyday, you know, investor or trader who just wants to, you know, have a little nibble, have a little bite, you know, Binance is perfectly acceptable, um, especially if you're wanting to like on ramp a little bit of capital here and there. Um, they've got a great service and I've, I've had no complaints um, using their platform themselves. But if you've got a little bit more capital that you actually want to allocate properly, I'd go through a crypto broker. One that comes to mind is Stormrake. They're based in Melbourne. Um, I've used their services before, so uh, I think that they would be good enough to handle good size if you want to throw it behind it. So if you want to kind of have self-service, small amounts of capital, I'd go with Binance. But if you're having uh, bigger size or you're having bigger capital allocations you want to go through on a regular basis, then using your own crypto broker like Stormrake would be a good suggestion. And where would you suggest to store the crypto? Where would you store your Bitcoin? Not your keys, not your cheese. Right. So that's a that's a thing that a lot of um, crypto people are saying now. So and I have been saying for a long time. So self custody your crypto, learn how you need to set up your own cold wallet, write down the 12 or 24 uh, words for a seed phrase, you know, have a hardware wallet, have like a, a hot wallet, you know, whether that be on your phone or a MetaMask, a little bit of liquid funds in there just so you can interact on chain if you ever need to to do so. But yeah, always just learn how to set up your own wallets, especially your own cold storage and have a majority of your crypto assets there and always, always self-custody your crypto. And on the topic of self-custody, if you don't know where the yield is coming from, when somebody's offering it to you, you are the yield, right? <laughs> you depositing your funds, you are the yield, right? Because, you know, look, that's unfortunately how, how Ponzi's work and uh, but just be be uh, conscious of that, and not, there is no such thing as a free launch, right? Yeah. That's true in traditional finance. That's true in crypto. It doesn't matter. It's true in DeFi. There is no free lunch. So just do your and if research. Something's and too good to be true. It probably is. Yeah, absolutely. Even if it's like you know a couple of percentage points, why would you risk a hundred percent of your principal or a hundred percent of your assets for three, exactly. four, five percent, six percent? I mean, that's, that's such a low yield for such a massive risk, right? If it was really crazy yields and you're doing yield farming, you know, hopefully in the next bull run, you'll do a bit of yield farming, then yeah, that's worth it because there's, there's upsized returns as protocols try to get liquidity and bootstrap that liquidity to 
get off the ground. But um, if it's just a small, small yield, you know, what's, what's the point? You're risking so much for so little. Agreed 100%. Well, thank you very much, Bashir, for your time and the first episode of The Crypt. And it was an absolute pleasure. Take it Likewise. easy. We'll episode two, week. I'm going to be asking you questions, Alex. Ready to go, bro. <laughs> hey, Ella, take it easy, man. Take care, guys. Bye. Bye.